you haven't uh, we were planning to attend Drupal Camp London um, but unfortunately due to the COVID-19 situation our company decided not to fly us out um, but we uh, were able to uh, to do this remotely so that's why I'm here now um, right working in the Drupal issue queue um, my name is Ilke Blok I'm a senior Drupal developer at OneShoe in the Netherlands uh, once you is a full service digital agency. Um, I'm on Twitter at Ilkeblog, and I'm also Ilkeblog on Drupal.org. Um, I'm not sure how we should handle questions. Uh, you could shoot them over on Twitter. I'll have a. Uh, I'll keep an eye on that, um, or maybe we can just do it through microphone. Um, Right, what will we talk about today? Um, uh, first of all, what are issues and what is the issue queue? Uh, just to, uh, to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, then we'll talk about issue statuses and priorities. Uh, the issue template, I'll explain. Um, we'll talk quite a bit about patches, how to create patches, how to apply patches, how to reroll patches, that sort of thing. Um, and then maybe if we have time, I can give you a sneak peek into the future uh, for Drupal issue queue and working on the, uh, the software. So what's an issue? Um, basically any change to Drupal or a contributed project will be described in an issue on Drupal.org. Um, there's various categories. Um, of, of issues, uh, bugs, features, tasks, plans, and support requests. Um, in other settings, you might also refer to them as, uh, as tickets, for example, if you are work in a support organization or something like that. Um, so what then is the issue queue? Um, Drupal Core has one, and each contributed project has one. Um, there are also some special issue queues on Drupal.org. Uh, the ideas issue queue is um, is a nice one. If you have a good idea for uh, Drupal, uh, you could first create an issue in the ideas issue queue to see what people think about it, maybe flesh out the idea together. And then only when the ideas are concrete, you can um, actually start building software and patches in the, the actual Drupal issue queue. Um, people refer to the issue queue. There is actually uh, a single overview of all the issues on Drupal.org. It's at Drupal.org slash project slash issues. Um, it could be interesting to see uh, the, the sheer volume of, uh, of issues that is available, but actually it's more practical usually to look at the issues for just a single project. And you get, the, uh, you get to see those when you put the name of the project behind that URL. Um, every project will have a block like this. If you look on, uh, on your computer, you will see this on the uh, right sidebar. Or if you're looking on a mobile phone, for example, uh, you'll see it at the bottom. Um, it's like an overview block of that project's uh, issue queue. It has a little search box, um, uh, an overview of how many uh, open issues there are, uh, how many uh, issues to review, the total numbers, and also uh, bugs are singled out because they're obviously pretty important. Some uh, nice statistics about how many new issues were created, how quickly uh, or um, whether um, uh, response has been given, that sort of thing. 
And then the issue queue uh, itself looks like this. Um, this is the one for Drupal core. Uh, you can search for keywords, you can filter by status, priority, that sort of thing. Um, one important part, if you um, start working in the Drupal issue queue is um, if you work for a company, then list that company in your Drupal.org profile. Um, when you work on issues, and especially, uh, or not, not just, but uh, when you um, supply patches or where you, when you just um, weigh in with your opinion, you get issue credit uh, once uh, an issue has been committed. And if you tie that to your company, your company will get credit as well. And it will, for example, influence the position where it's listed on the um, uh, Drupal.org marketplace. So how do you do that? Um, when you click on your avatar uh, on the top right in uh, on Drupal.org, you click on my account, you go to profile, you go to edit that profile. And then when you scroll all the way to the bottom, you get to this a set of uh, vertical tabs. And then in the work tab, you can uh, select your current company as well as any previous companies that you might have worked for. Right, um, on to the various categories of issues. Uh, first up is support requests. Um, you could create a support request issue when you're having trouble using Drupal or uh, some contributed module. Or what actually is also pretty common is uh, if somebody opens, um, for example, a feature request or a bug report, somebody else comes along uh, that basically thinks, well, that is supported, that is possible, you're just doing it wrong. Um, they might actually change it to uh, be a support request. And then obviously the neighborly thing to do is to actually also say what, uh, how you should be doing it and how you can actually achieve what you are, are trying to do. Um, I personally don't consider um, an issue in the issue queue the best way to get support. Um, so you probably should consider using other means of getting support. Um, just a web search. I use DuckDuckGo for that myself. It has a convenient URL, duck.com. Um, of course, you could also use Google for something like that or whatever uh, other search engine you prefer. Um, somewhere where you might actually have a good chance of ending up when you do a web search is Stack Exchange. Um, there is a Drupal dedicated Stack Exchange which is a question and answer site, um, which has very good information as well. Um, and obviously, if you cannot find the answer to your question, you can uh, you can ask your question on there. There are very a lot of people in the community are actually on there as well who can uh, can support you. And then um, for more interactive experience, uh, basically there's Slack and IRC. They're both um, chat solutions. RC is more like the old school way of doing things. It's got a bit of a learning curve, although the page you see linked there is uh, is quite good and can help you uh, get connected. And then there is Slack, of course, uh, which is uh, basically the same idea, although it's probably a bit easier to get on. Um, and everything to do with Drupal on Slack is listed on the page you see linked there, Drupal.org slash Slack. So next up, Bugs. Um, all this is basically, uh, by the way, it's based on definitions for core. Um, and the definitions might differ a little bit for other projects, although they generally follow the core definitions. Um, a bug is a functional error in the system. You could think of examples like a uh, PHP error, such as a warning or a notice, uh, data loss, uh, regressions in functionality, memory leaks, that sort of thing. Obviously, they have different um, severity, but that's something we'll, we'll get to uh, later. Um, then there's tasks. Um, basically, tasks are things that need to be done, but they're neither a bug nor a feature. Uh, examples could include um, refactoring code to make it more readable, adding automated tests for something that has uh, doesn't have tests yet, or maybe add some more tests, 
um, refactoring functions for performance as long as it, um, it's not causing functional errors because otherwise it basically would be a bug. Um, update, updating code to new APIs, that sort of thing. Um, feature requests. Basically, any completely new functionality would be a feature request. Um, for example, new modules, um, like the media browser, for example, that was added uh, not so, so long ago. Um, new subsystems like JSON API and adding or actually also removing an option from some administration form, for example, could all be called feature requests. Um, then there's plans. Um, I copied the definition from the documentation, actually. Um, it says plans are used for meta issues that capture process and give an overview to problems that cannot be solved with one issue. Plan issues will often have multiple sub steps in related child issues. And those are issues that have the plan issue and their parent issue relationship field. Um, basically, um, it's like for, for bigger things that need um, more small steps to actually accomplish, it can be divided into small steps. Um, you might see a plan for that. Right, we'll move on to um, issue priorities. Um, these are basically the four ones that you might find. Um, guidelines for when a priority can be applied are based on the category, so uh, bugs, feature requests, that sort of thing. And the guidelines get less strict with lower priorities. Um, you'll see that um, critical issues can actually block the release of major versions like 8.0, 9.0. Um, major versions, if any critical bugs apply to them, won't be released until all of them have been fixed. Um, that does not apply to minor patches like uh, 810, 801, 7.1, for example. Um, major issues are used for issues that are not critical, but do have significant impact or important by community consensus. Basically, everyone agreed that it's important uh, and can become major. Um, they are prioritized in current development release, and they may actually be backported to uh, stable releases where applicable, for example, uh, we're currently on Drupal 8.8, but 8.7 is still um, supported. Um, any major bug might actually be backported to uh, 8.7 as well, if it makes sense. Um, and then there's normal and minor. Um, basically, um, normal was everything else. Minor is um, limited to usually um, cosmetic, uh, small little problems. For example, uh, so when is an issue considered critical? Um, bugs can be considered critical uh, when it when they render a site unusable and there is no workaround. When there is data loss, actually the actual data in the site um, is uh, destroyed for some reason, um, or security vulnerabilities. You'll see a, a small asterisk there because security vulnerabilities should actually usually be reported through the proper channels, the secure.drupal.org site. Um, they should not be reported through the regular issue queue because that's public. Um, and we would like to keep those under wraps until there's actually a solution for the problem. Um, tasks. Uh, might be critical when there are severe performance issues, uh, significant regressions, and a maintainer can always decide that an issue uh, should not block a release actually and can downgrade it in that case. Uh, features are actually rarely critical and would be at the maintainer's discretion to make a feature critical. Um, when is an issue major? Um, Bugs might be major um, when they have significant repercussions, but do not render the whole system unusable or when they have a known workaround. Um, for example, they could interfere with normal site visitors' use of the site. Um, 
they might render one feature unusable with no workaround as opposed to the entire site. Um, they might be blocking contributed projects without a workaround. Um, or uh, when user input is caused to be lost, um, but not actually um, corrupting existing data. So that's the difference between uh, a critical bug and a major bug might be that actual data uh, in the system um, being broken would be critical. Well, if you try to get data into the system that's lost, that would be major. It's still obviously a big problem, but not as big as if existing data would be destroyed. Um, tasks could be major for important API additions, refactoring, uh, other significant changes that are not bugs. Um, an example could include um, code refactoring, like the removal of the taxonomy term reference field uh, in favor of entity reference, which I think happened from uh, Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. Um, or decoupling Drupal core from a dependency that's no longer supported, that sort of thing. Um, and features uh, could be major based on their value to the project overall, um, or the scope uh, of work to complete them. An example could be providing a better UX for creating, editing, and managing draft revisions, for example. Um, and like we said, like I said before, um, normal and minor, we haven't discussed that normal would be everything else and minor is basically cosmetic issues that do influence the functionality or, or sorry, do not influence the functionality or main purpose. Right, on to issue statuses. Um, these are the major statuses an issue could have. Um, I drew some transitions that make sense. Um, basically, there are no limitations to what status you, from what status you go, can go to which status. Um, usually, uh, or issues will start out on uh, active. Uh, it's the default. It means there is no patch. Uh, and sometimes uh, it can also be used to reset an issue even when a patch has been attached. Um, issue will then move to needs review when a patch has been added. Um, it means uh, the issue needs review and testing of the patch. Uh, it's also a trigger for the test bot to um, start testing the patch, apply it to the project and see if all the tests still run. Um, or if there's no test, it could also be that somebody um, came up with an idea that they think uh, needs reviewing. And that status is also used by people looking for issues to review, see if there are patches and they, uh, a review is needed. Um, after that, the issue might move on to needs work. Uh, it means it has a patch, but there is additional work to be done. It could be set uh, by a reviewer who looked at the patch and found uh, there's uh, work to be done. The test bot will also do this if tests fail. It will automatically set the issue to need work. Or the author could actually do it themselves, uh, saying, OK, I'm not actually finished with this yet. It needs some additional work. That could go back and forth a few times, needs review, needs work. And eventually, if everybody agrees that it is good to go, uh, the status will be made reviewed and tested by the community. You'll see that often um, shorted into RTBC. Um, it means that the issue received sufficient reviewing and it's deemed ready to be committed. Uh, usually that is not set by the patch author, by, but by somebody else. And it's basically a judgment call whether it can be set to RTPC. Uh, it's about whether everyone who has done a review actually um, agrees that it's good to go. Um, it looks like uh, enough people looked at it to agree that it's good to go, that sort of thing. Also, this status does not mean it will be committed. Um, and it's still up to the maintainer. And uh, it might actually get uh, reset to uh, need to review again, or maybe even need to work if somebody feels it needs to be. Um, if an issue is on this status, uh, reviewed and tested by the community for a long time, that might actually be uh, an indication that it needs to be re-evaluated. Re um, 
then there's a um, status patch to be ported. Um, once an issue has been committed, it might move to that. Um, if it, the problem also applies to a different version, for example, of Drupal, um, something might be solved on Drupal 8 first, and then it might need to be need a port back to Drupal 7, for example. Um, once something is committed and there is actually no patch to be ported, um, it will get moved to fixed. And uh, that status basically only exists to have it still show up in the issue queue because after a while uh, it will be automatically transitioned to closed fixed, in which case it will not show up in the, uh, the issue queue any longer. And that should be specifically uh, filter for it, I think. Then there is two versions of postponed. Um, the first one is just regular postponed. It means the issue is still valid and should be fixed, but there are blockers. Uh, in that case, um, if you put it to postpone, make sure that the issue is marked as blocked and state which issues uh, are blocking it uh, and also attach those related issues. Um, or it means that the issue is not being worked on actively, but the, the intention is to actually return to it. And then postponed maintainer needs more info, basically means there's insufficient information in the issue to proceed. Um, and if it stays there too long, um, the maintainer might actually decide to put it to closed, cannot reproduce or closed, won't fix. Um, that's also an indication I drew only closed uh, in this um, flow chart, but there's actually, I'm cheating a little bit because there is actually six different versions of closed. Um, we're running a bit late, uh, so I won't go through them all. But um, like I said, closed fixed is basically not something you should put an issue to yourself. Uh, the others could all be set by um, you as a user or somebody else, and they have their specific meanings. Um, and they do make a lot of sense if you want to look at it um, or want to find out what they all mean exactly. It is all documented on Drupal.org as well. So moving on, um, when you create a new issue, um, actually it's important when you think about creating a new issue to know when you should not create a new issue. The link you see on the screen has a good article about this. Um, it's titled How to Solve All Your Problems. And basically it's about this uh, subject. It helps you narrow down your, your, uh, your issues, your, your, the problems that you encounter and make sure that uh, when you actually end up creating an issue that you um, really found something new. Um, for example, uh, you should always try the latest code. That means the development version. So it might not even be um, the latest release. Uh, there might be a development version of whatever module you found a problem with uh, that has already um, a solution for your problem. You should check the issue queue for existing issues. Um, but when you do find an issue that looks a lot like yours, uh, do not change the version um, because usually um, uh, issues only apply to a specific version and you might have the same problem, but then it's a good idea to actually create a new issue for the other version. When you check the issue queue, um, try search terms you would use to describe your issue but also use search terms that somebody else might use to describe the issue. Um, and do not reopen closed issues unless um, uh, it was closed very recently and you find that it's not actually fixed and do explain in that case. Um, otherwise, um, it's better to create a new issue actually. And lastly, uh, make sure to always run updates. There's many um, problems that sites encounter, which can be traced back to not actually having run updates properly, either through Drush updb um, or through the updates PHP web page, um, can also help. And then, when all else fails, you could actually create an issue. Um, make sure you only report one issue per issue. That sounds a bit silly, but um, 
can probably understand what I mean. Don't put an entire uh, very long list of all the issues you found with some project in a single issue, or even worse, multiple projects. Um, make the title descriptive, uh, not too short, not too long, um, so that people understand what it is about. And then in the issue summary, give enough information. Obviously, not too much, um, but do give enough information for people to be able to reproduce, for example, that's the next bullet point. Steps to reproduce, what should somebody who tries to um, uh, understand your, uh, your issue do to see the, see the issue themselves? And lastly, use the issue template. Uh, the issue template is uh, linked here, drupal.org slash issue summaries. Um, it's somewhere on that page. It looks like this. You can copy paste it directly in the issue, or you can use a tool like Text Expander. I have it on a, on a, a short string I can type on the keyboard, uh, and it will just fill this out for me. It starts with the problem motivation. Why did you file the issue? Uh, the steps to reproduce uh, should be in there as well if you have them, that sort of thing. Then your proposed resolution. Um, why do you think this is the best solution? Maybe any workarounds that exist uh, for people who cannot use the patch. Any remaining tasks uh, is the next uh, heading uh, that would could include create a patch, create tests, uh, reviews, documentation needs to be written, that sort of thing. Uh, then come a few sections that basically describe what would change if your patch were applied. Uh, changes to the user interface, changes to the API, changes to the data model. Um, part of this is also a, re a release note snippet. Um, if the um, issue ends up being in a release, um, what could be added to the release notes to explain what was changed. And then um, lastly, if you uh, applied this template to an existing issue, you could leave the original report as created by whoever created that uh, issue originally. Right, then what's a patch? <clears throat> um, a patch basically is a file describing changes that need to be made to a set of other files. For example, Drupal itself, contributed module. Um, uh, we name patches for uh, uh, according to a certain convention, and there's actually a naming convention for every taste. Uh, if you look on uh, on the URL linked here, uh, you'll find that there's actually numerous um, naming conventions. Um, Basically, pick the one that you prefer most. Um, I like um, uh, a lot of description so that it makes it easy to um, identify the patch. Well, the first one is like this. It's the, the least descriptive one, actually. It's just the issue number and the comment number where you posted the patch in the issue. Um, then the next one is a bit more descriptive. It adds the description at the start of the patch name. And then the uh, last one is even more descriptive because it also adds the project name in the patch. I like this one most. I usually use this one uh, because it makes it most easy to, um, to identify a patch file. Um, then there is two variations. Um, the first one actually has some um, functional implications. It tells the test bot to not actually test this patch if you put do not test in your uh, patch file name. Uh, the second indicates that you expect this patch to actually fail and why that is uh, useful I will uh, tell you a little bit later. Um, I don't think this has any functional uh, implications at all. Uh, you also see tests only, for example, to, for this. Um, right, then working with patches. Um, 
remember that Git is your friend. Git is a very powerful tool that even though we do not use it to create pull requests, for example, it's still very useful to work with patches. Uh, so before you start, make sure you have a clone of the project's Git repo. Um, what I usually do, um, you will run into uh, the need for creating a patch while working on a project. What I usually do is I'll make the changes within that project that will obviously be, um, for example, in a composer downloaded module. So it will be hard to, to get it into the, to get it into a patch. I then create a clone and I'll copy the files from the, uh, uh, the changed files from our project over into the clone. Um, so first of all, let's look at what you do for to apply a patch, an existing patch that you downloaded from Google.org uh, and you want to continue work on, for example. Um, you find the commit where that patch was created from. Um, this step can often be skipped, although it can be important later on. Um, you create a branch at that point. Uh, for example, you could use the issue number uh, and then I put a temp number there, it would, it would usually not correspond to the actual comment number that you would put in the patch name, um, because you might have several patches coming from the same branch. Um, so it could be something like this. It could also be a description of what you're trying to solve, that sort of thing, that branch name doesn't make that much of a difference. Um, then you'll apply the patch using git apply minus V is for verbose so that you can see what uh, is actually happening there. And you commit uh, the changes that the patch has made. Again, the message doesn't really make uh, much difference except for yourself. It's useful to actually report what patch you actually applied there. Um, and that's it, that's where you have your patch applied and can work, continue working with it. So what would you do if you create a patch? You basically start with the same first two steps, uh, although you'll probably want to start with the tip of the uh, branch that you actually want to solve the problem for, so you don't have to find the commit where the patch was created from because you're still creating a patch. You create a branch and you just solve your problem that would be, look like something like this, and you commit. Um, you make a commit message, solve the issue, whatever. You can, you can uh, come up with your own uh, submit message or commit message that makes sense to you, and then you can create a patch with git diff. Um, you basically um, list the changes between the current branch, the in this case the 8.x.1.0. Uh, which is a tag, and you uh, list the changes uh, with your actual solved. Can you see my mouse counter or not? Probably. Um, and basically, list the changes between these points in Git. What I will usually do is I'll leave off the um, patch name, and you can just see the changes then in your terminal. You can see what the patch would look like. And then when, you, when that satisfies you, you can um, uh, redirect it into a patch file name. That even works when you do it like this, when you have a few more commits. So I like to make a lot of commits usually when I uh, am programming. Um, and you can use the exact same uh, git command again to get a patch name. Um, something else that you might come, a, um, come across and that people would, might actually request if you post patches, especially if the, uh, if the issue is getting a bit long, is an interdiff. Um, it's a way for reviewers to quickly understand the changes that you made from one patch to the next. And um, it's basically a patch itself, only from um, one point in your basically your patch history then um, from to the next for example i went back to the previous slide 
uh, if you wanted to create an interdiff, uh, if you, for example, you created a patch here and then later on you created a patch over there, you could actually create an interdiff by doing git diff between this commit and that commit. And you pipe it into another file, just call it uh, interdiff uh, something something.txt. And you have your interdiff file and it helps reviewers to understand what changes you've made since the last version uh, of your patch. So that's an interdiff. Um, right, moving on to re-rolling patches. That's also something you'll see. Um, you will find that um, you might actually have found an issue that um, uh, covers the problem you've encountered. You are happy to find that there is actually a patch. You try to apply it to your project and you find it doesn't apply anymore. Um, that might happen if the base project changed in such a way that the patch, uh, well, <laughs> the base project changed uh, so much that the patch no longer applies. Um, and that actually uh, means there is a merge conflict. Um, and it just so happens that although you might not think so, Git is actually very good at resolving conflicts by itself. Uh, it's much better than um, most uh, patches can figure out or most uh, mechanisms to apply patches. So to illustrate, um, let's see, say we um, did actually find the commit where the patch was uh, applied. This is where we actually could go back to the very first slide about patches. This is where it becomes really important to find out from where the commit or sorry, the patch was created. Uh, you find that commit, you apply the patch or you create a branch and you apply the patch there. And what you can then do is um, just use uh, Git to merge in the latest version of the project. In many cases, that will actually be all you need to do. In others, uh, there might actually be some merge conflicts that, uh, that Git cannot figure out itself either. And you have to solve those. But at that point, it's no different than uh, solving a merge conflict in any other Git project. And once you've done that, you resolved any conflicts that there might be, you can just go back to what you've learned before. You can do a Git diff. Uh, make sure that you do the difference between uh, the tip of your um, patch branch against the commit that was actually merged in. And by that time, you will have re-rolled a patch. And you can post it. You can say, OK, thanks. I, uh, I re-rolled this against version whatever. Um, And people will be happy because you helped them uh, getting the patch applied again. Uh, right, then I quickly mentioned before test only patches. Um, many projects actually require tests. Um, and then the, uh, it becomes a challenge to actually demonstrate that the tests that you created that go with your patch actually test uh, the changes you've made. And what better way uh, is there to have a patch that only contains your tests? Because when uh, trying to run those tests and your code is not actually there, those tests would actually fail. Um, you could do this, for example, by having a separate branch where you only build the tests. Um, and then you merge that um, uh, into your full patch branch, and that makes it pretty easy with the workflow and uh, I've shown you to get test only uh, patches as well as a full patch. Um, so that concludes my slides on the current state of things. Um, I, I can't really, I was hoping that I was actually there to, to see you, but um, basically I don't think anybody currently thinks this is a workflow that is fit for 2020. Um, the future, and we're already with one 
uh, put in that feature is GitLab. Um, it's already being used on Drupal.org. There's git.drupalcode.org, which is where you end up if you click the uh, browse code repository link that every project page has. Uh, so it's already being used for browsing repositories and work is actually being done right now to have per issue repositories, um, which would also enable um, editing the, in the online browser on GitLab, um, which could be very useful for little typos in documentation, for example, or in translation strings, that sort of thing. Um, it would not uh, require you to create a Git clone, go through all the patching, uh, that sort of thing, but you can just create an issue, create a quick edit in uh, GitLab, and create a pull request. That would be very nice. And obviously, it will also be very nice to not having to create all these patches, just being able to push to um, per issue repository um, and collaborate that way. Uh, an example that is posted somewhere on Drupal.org looks like this. Uh, you'll see the um, main branch on the left uh, for some project. It is actually based on the interaction in a particular issue. Um, and then you see people collaborating. Uh, and finally, you also see somewhere over here, somebody made some changes that were actually uh, not used in the end. You'll see some people interacting. Every color represents somebody else. And eventually, um, the main branch is merged in, and then it's merged back into the main branch. And that would conclude that issue. Uh, so fingers crossed, this doesn't take too much time uh, anymore, because personally, I'm quite fed up with patches, actually, but we're still stuck with them for the moment. Um, Right, that concludes my talk. Uh, so are there any questions? I'm just looking at uh, Twitter in case anybody used that. I guess there are some more questions. Yeah, no, there's no questions. <laughs> no questions, okay. Um, then I guess we finish early. Are you guys having some get-together tonight? Yeah, we're about to go to the coin laundry for a social night. Very good. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> okay, shame I can't be there. I have a lot of fun, guys, and uh, it was nice to be able to do this. It will be online probably tomorrow now. But cool. yeah, so yeah. Cool, I'll, have a, I'll look out for that. Brilliant. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, too. Thank Cheers. You. Bye. Bye-bye.